Welcome friends to raw online program. Today we will see about tricyclic antidepressant toxicity. Okay. So antidepressant medications were on a wide scale because depression is a global burden. So these were the main components. It was identified that decrease in norepinephrine and serotonin was the major cause of depression. So attempts were made to increase the norepinephrine and the serotonin in the brain. So one such mechanism is to stop the reuptake of these enzymes. So tertiary amines and secondary amines. In tertiary amines, these are specifically inhibit serotonin more than norepinephrine. Secondary amines inhibit norepinephrine reuptake more than serotonin reuptake. So these tertiary amines are amitriptyline, doxepin, imipramine or the major tertiary amines. Among secondary is the desipramine, nortriptyline. It has to be understood that amitriptyline get metabolized into nortriptyline and imipramine gets metabolized into desipramine. So why this toxicity is on the high scale is number one. These drugs are prescribed to people who are already in depression. So they are more prone for suicidal tendencies and self-harm. So these are easily available drugs for them. So the toxicity is still on the rising scale. Moreover, these were the initial compounds that were related to antidepressive medications. But later, specific serotonin reuptake inhibitors and specific norepinephrine reuptake inhibitors are coming into picture. But still, these TCAs are still used for major other uses. So these are the uses. One is depression, obviously. Second is neurologic pain, migraines, enuresis, sleep disorder, abscissal compressive disorder, and attention deficit hyperkinetic disorder. Because TCA is being used for all these current conditions, TCA usage is still on the high record, and thus a toxicity is still recorded worldwide. So what are the toxicity dosages? Therapeutic dose, if you watch very carefully, the therapeutic dose is 2 to 4 mg per kg per day. This is for adults. Compare this with children, the toxic dose itself is just more than 5. So, in your house, if there is an elderly gentleman or a woman who is on therapeutic medication for 2 to 4 mg per kg per day, if that drug is being consumed by a child, then it could be a toxic dose for that particular child. So this is how the usual presentation also will be like a child who has consumed a two or three tablets of an elderly gentleman or a woman in your house and coming with the classical clinical features. Anyway, the toxic dose for adults is again 10 to 20 mg per kg and overall in general more than one gram ingestion is considered to be toxic. So the points to remember is the therapeutic dosage of 2 to 4 mg per kg per day can be toxic for children, even just two tablets, even just double dose of an adult can be toxic to children. Pharmacokinetics, once it is taken in, it's completely absorbed from the GI tract. The peak concentration is two to eight hours. Why is it two to eight hours? Usually we say two to four hours, right? So why is it two to eight hours? How significant is this? This is because TCA in general, they have anticholinergic effects. They can decrease your GI motility, thereby decreasing the speed of absorption. So it takes a longer time for this ACA, TCAs to get absorbed, that is 2 to 8 hours. So once it is absorbed from the stomach, extensive first pulse metabolism happens. Thus, the bioavailability is very, very low. So once it comes to the bloodstream, whatever is available in the bloodstream is again distributed to the fat because it is highly lipophilic. There's a large volume of distribution, around 40 liters per kg. So this gets distributed to the heart, brain, liver, and kidney. It goes to very high scale that the tissue to plasma ratio can exceed up to 10 is to 1. The tissues only 1% stays in the plasma. It's 10 is to 1. Such high will be the lipophilicity of this tricyclic antidepressants. So having said it is 10 is to 1. It loves the fat and it goes to the lipophilic molecules. So there's one component you should be aware the log D. So octanol by water partition coefficient is a measure of the lipid solubility. So this lipid solubility 
at the physiological pH is called as log B. Okay. So, log P is nothing but the lipyl so solubility and that log P at physiological pH is called as log D. So, more the log D, the more is going to be your lipid solubility. So, amitriptyline has 3.9, almost 4, nortriptyline is almost 3 and imipropyline almost 2 and disipropyline is 1. So, this high is going to be a lipid solubility. So, amitriptyline toxicity is what you will be seeing in your ER and CCU on the higher scale is this because of this reason. It has high lipid solubility. So, how it can relate to your toxicity, we will see in the next slides, next few slides. So, having said, whatever goes to the stomach and intestine and gets observed, goes to the extensive first pass metabolism. Once it comes out of the first pass metabolism, extensive volume of distribution and get deposited in the lipophilic uh, areas and only 2% is present in the blood. Even that 2% is bound to proteins, the alpha-1 acid glycoprotein. So, now, having said that, these are bound to the proteins. It means when the protein concentration is low, the free unbound toxic drug will be on the higher side. And moreover, having said that it is bound to your proteins, it means that it gets influenced by your pH, right? So, this AAG, AAG means alpha-1 acid glycoprotein. The AAG concentration and pH values of your patient determines the toxicity as well. So, this line is very, very, very important. More acidic, more unbound free drug. This makes alkalinization a therapy by itself. So, having understood this, then the CAs undergo demethylation, aromatic hydroxylation and glucuronate conjugation and then comes out either in the bile or in the kidneys. So, if it is coming in the bile, again it goes for enterohepatic recirculation. Around 30% again goes for intrahepatic recirculation and hardly 5% is excreted by the kidneys. It is for this reason, elimination half-life has of 7 to 58 hours. Why is it 7 to 58 hours? One reason is because of enterohepatic recirculation. And second is, if your patient has a decreased renal clearance, even this 5% which should be excreted by kidneys can still remain in your blood as a toxic dose. And all this metabolization, especially the hydroxylation, happens by your cytochrome enzymes. By genetically itself, some people can be poor metabolizers. So, all put together, this is the reason why the elimination half-life is somewhere around 7 to 58 hours. If it's going to be 58 hours, it simply tells you your, the drug is going to remain in your blood for very long. So, what could be the presentation ideally? So, it could be a cardiac conduction abnormalities, hypotension, seizures and ARDS, so pathophysiology. Slow is the recovery from inactivation of the fast sodium channels. Basically, this affect the sodium channels, wherever it is in the brain or in the heart or anywhere it acts, it's going to affect your sodium channels. So, how does it affect? It just slows the recovery from the inactivation. Basically, it inactivates, that's all it means. So, this is your hashing potential. You can see the slope 0 is because of sodium channel. So, having said the tricyclic TCAs, the tricyclic acids as act at this sodium level. So, this part of action potential is third. So, slowing of phase 0. This is the depolarization or the contraction, effective contraction curve. So, it is a phase 0 that is get affected. So, this correlates with your QRS complex. So, since the sodium channel is affected, this zero phase of action potential is affected, thus causing the QRS prolongation, okay. Otherwise also, in any normal human, the impulse gets conducted from the SA node to AV node. From the AV node, it goes to the bundle office. From the bundle office, it gets diverted to the left branch first and then comes to the right bundle branch. There is some amount of delay in normal individual itself, but it is usually masked. So, in this kind of prolongation of QRS complexes or in generalized prolongation of conduction, this minimal delay from right to left is exaggerated. Thereby, usually your patient will have RBBB. Hope you got the concept clear. In other ways, normal individual also, there will be a subtle delay to the right bundle branches. But it will be masked in our routine heart rate like 60 to 100 usually get masked. But in this TCA toxicity, where the overall 
mechanism itself is prolonged, this subtle delay to the right branch blocks will be exaggerated so your patient can present with RBBB. Remember this very concept. This is your cell. This is your membrane. Having said the membrane, it's a lipophilic membrane, it's a lipid membrane, lipid bimolecular membrane. So in alkaline pH, your drug gets bound to your lipids. In acidic pH, it gets bound to your receptor, the sodium channels. So now tell me a drug which has more amount of alkalinity. You can choose any drug which can produce alkalinity inside the patient body. Meanwhile, it is to be understood it's a sodium channel that is getting blocked, right, in this mechanism. If your drug can add a pinch of sodium, it's going to be more better. So now tell me a drug which has a pinch of sodium and also can create some amount of alkalinity. Sodium alkalinity. What is the drug? The water drug is sodium bicarbonate. So sodium bicarbonate is a treatment of choice. So how will you give? When will you give? How long will you give? When will you stop? So we'll see that. Coming to the cardiovascular system, the first presentation, what is the most common rhythm in TCA toxicity? Understand this is going to be sinus tachycardia. It could be because of anti-muscarinic effect, vasodilatory because of reflux tachycardia or primarily sympathorhumidic effects also. So the most common rhythm is sinus tachycardia. The next is going to be the white complex tachycardia. Hope I explained you in detail why there is a white complex tachycardia. White complex tachycardia is because of slowing of conduction, not because of any other MI or not any ischemic reasons, it's because of slowing of conduction where even the aberrant pathway gets activated. So when the aberrant pathway gets activated, we call this as SVT with aberrancy, supraventricular tachycardia with aberrancy. Because since the primary pathway is slowed down to a such an extent that the aberrant pathway takes up. So this is called SVT with aberrancy. And there will be some amount of QTC prolongation also. It has to be understood. QRS is for depolarization. That means a contraction basically. QT is for repolarization. But in TCA toxicity, this QTC prolongation is mainly because there is slow depolarization which is causing a slow repolarization also. So there is, this drug does not act on a repolarization areas at all, not at that point of the curve. But since the depolarization is very much delayed, this slowing of conduction gets through to the repolarization surface also. So there will be QTC prolongation. So patient can have tachycardia and more the tachycardia, more the widening of complexes and QTC prolongation. And usually all this white complex tachycardia will improve with the rate control. Once the rate settles back to normal, you will be able to see that white complexes, the QRS complex and QT prolongation should come back to normalcy. But can we give any drug to control the rate directly? Answer is no. This patient will have tachycardia with various reasons. It could be an hypoxia, it could be increase in temperature, or it could be just dehydration, it could be a, a vasodilatory state. So all these things, the, the, the reason why the patient is having sinus tachycardia should be controlled, not the rate directly. Next, apart from your ECG changes, your patient can have hypotension. So why should your patient have hypotension? It could be because of direct myocardial depression, because of sodium channel issues. I hope I told you. The TCA poisoning affects the sodium channel anywhere in your body. So this disrupts the, the coupling of myocytes and impairs your cardiac contractivity. Okay, And also an alpha analgesic blockade and causing peripheral vasodilatation. It down-regulates adrenergic receptors and decreases response to any catecholamine of that sort. So having said this, it has to be understood again that TCAs are mainly reuptake inhibitors. What is in by reuptake inhibitors? So there is a neuron or any, any, any nerve of that sort. It puts out norepinephrine and serotonin and to a certain extent after the action is over, this norepinephrine and serotonin is taken back called as a reuptake. It is at that level, this TCAs act and they stop this reuptake, right? Basically, these neurons or the nerves will be dried up. It has already given whatever neural has already happened, already present in it. So, if you start dopamine in this patient, how does dopamine act? 
it gets converted into norad and then gets action right so already your nerves are dried up it doesn't have any more norepinephrine inside it so there is no use in starting a dopamine which is dependent again on the noradrenaline inside your nerves so it's better to start noradrenaline directly than starting a pro drug like dopamine your patient can have seizures and the incidence is only 4 to 13 percent usually it is brief having said it as brief i simply mean to say status epilepticus is uncommon in this so why should seizures occur answer is simple your patient is depressed and you are giving some drugs to activate the brain literally right so increase in monoamines in the brain this is the mechanism of action of your tcas particularly the norepinephrine this norepinephrine if it's going to be on high concentration of brain it can induce severe seizures in your brain and direct muscarinic antagonism and of course the sodium channel alterations and inhibition or inhibitory neurons hope you know that gaba is an inhibitor and inhibition of inhibitory neurons will activate the brain causing seizures understand your one great point dear friends in a patient with tca toxicity if your patient has seizures it simply means just at the end of seizures your patient is going to crash for sure why does it happens usually seizures means that the patient may not able to breathe properly moreover the demand for oxygen is going to be very high because of excessive movement right so the respiration is hampered and the movement is severe that is called seizures right that's the main mechanism of seizures ultimately causing severe acidemia the lactic acidosis hope you remember that i mentioned that acidemia causes increased free drug and this free drug binds to the sodium channels causing more worsening of hypotension so immediately after your seizures after the patient seizures the patient is going to have severe hypotension possibly an intractable level of hypotension hypotension so get ready with your norad get ready with your volume uh, you can start your normaline or the rl what are the other cns manifestations direct antagonism of muscarinic and histaminic receptors could cause delirium agitation hallucinations and eventually lethargy and coma your patient could have ards your patient can have cardiovascular symptoms like rhythm abnormalities and more common is going to be a white complex tachycardia your patient can have hypotension for the reasons which i mentioned your patient can have seizures and post seizure intractable hypotension is going to be there and your patient could have ards also why so ards activation of platelet activating factor paf and protein kinase this causes constriction in the bronchus and also in the vessels so these constrictions causes increase in the arterial pressure so once there is increase in the arterial pressure and vessel constriction bronchial constriction leading to pulmonary edema so when there is severe constriction the treatment is going to be relaxation of this constriction right so for bronchial constriction ccbs calcium channel blockers could be the treatment for vessel constriction definitely nitric oxide donor can be the treatment of choice never ever forget that the tcas have anticholinergic effects these are some of the anticholinergic effects patient could have urinary retention patient have sedation confusion hallucinations patient have blurred visions and dry eyes patient could have tachycardia because of this reason itself patient could be totally dried up and decrease the sweating and patient have dry mouth remember dear friends this patient is more prone for constipation remember this will come to this seriousness and significance of this constipation in this particular patient except this constipation all the other anticholinergic symptoms are usually inconsequential we need not take that seriously except this constipation i'll come back to that so how will you diagnose first thing is ecg in ecg as i told you the most common rhythm is tachycardia the most common finding in ecg is going to be a tachycardia with obvious reasons so once there is tachycardia there will be prolonging of almost everything that you see there will be qrs prolonging yes because of zero phase of action potential the sodium channel is blocked and av first degree av block is called pr prolongation qtc gets uh, prolonged so it's going to be a complete prolongation in the ecg leads hope you are aware that the right sided bundles take a little delay in normal patients itself that gets exaggerated presenting as a terminal r wave and the s wave which we call as rbbb 
right bundle branch block. So this is the usual ECG finding. So whenever you find a patient with uh, toxicity, they say it's TCA, take out an ECG. And if you see this, it means that almost you can be sure that your patient has taken a TCA unless otherwise proved. So yes, you're going to do an ECG. How about the serum concentration? Can you rely on serum concentration? Answer is not much of use because I told you there's a large volume of distribution. So it's really 40, 40, 40 liters per kg. It's like distributed everywhere. So from the blood, if you take, it's only minimal quantity that's going to be present in your blood. So redistribution can happen. So serum concentration cannot be checked because of large volume of distribution. And prolonged absorption phase. This drug has prolonged absorption phase because of its anticholinergic effect. It can decrease the GI motility. So the absorption itself will take more than 8 hours. So at what point will you check? We don't know. And this drug has long distribution half-life and pH dependent protein binding. Hope you remember this. And wide interpatient variability of elimination. We don't know what's the renal status. We don't know what's the biliary and the stomach, the intestinal status of your patient, right? So because of all these parameters, we don't know exactly at what time this particular drug will cause a redistribution or increase in absorption or we don't know when this drug will get ex uh, excreted. So we exactly don't know at what point we should check or to what limit to give. So serum concentration may not be of much use in diagnosis of TCA poisoning. So history, history, history is going to be the clue. Therapeutic range is around 50 to 30 nanograms per ml, including the active metabolites. So qualitative tests have been advocated enzyme multiplied immunoassays. But this is of not that much serious things because qualitative tests can have false positive if your patient is on carbamazepine, cyclobenzaprine, thioridazine, diphenhydramine, cutipin, cryptoheptadine, like a lot of drugs. So the false positivity is very, very high for qualitative reasons. So having said the therapeutic range is 50 to 300 nanograms per ml, if something we can develop to quantify it, if you can give a number for how much the drug is there in the body, it can be helping. So thus came the ultra pressure liquid chromatography tandem mass spectrometry. This is capable of quantifying nine TCA drugs in less than five minutes. But it's recently validated, but it's not universally available. So fatal concentration by reports is said to be around 1,100 to 21,800 nanograms per ml. So understand this is all taken from dead people that because of TCA they die and then uh, the samples were taken and it reported to be around 1,100 to 21,800. Why specifically this is mentioned is in postmortem because of a redistribution your, your toxic drug dosage in the blood can go high as up to five times than when the patient is alive. So we don't know how much to rely on this when we are treating a live patient, right? So when in, in live patient sample, this 1,100 to 21,800 does not have much of significance. But in dead people, during postmortem, we know it's going to be more than five times increased. So this were the usual test results. So if, but if at all we have this UPLCMS in our, then we can do this. So treatment. Any patient who is coming to you, the first step is going to be stabilize the airway, breathing and circulation. Okay. If the patient is hypoxic, connect oxygen. If the patient is gasping, you need to intubate or and if circulation, connect you white bone needles and start with fluid resuscitation as much as the body tolerates. Then comes your GI decontamination with multi-dose activated charcoal. Is there any role for this activated charcoal? Answer is yes. You can do, you can give activated charcoal if your patient presents within two hours and the patient should be of normal mental status. Understand this and completely cooperative. Understand TCA is a drug given to people who are depressed. So I don't think they'll be completely cooperative. But if only your patient is cooperative, you can try GI decompression techniques. Or if it's an altered mental status and if he's intubated, then you can try. That's all. Okay. So why not single dose? Why multi-dose? Which one do you prefer? Answer is ideally advocated is single dose only. Single dose activated charcoal only. Because hope you remember this particular drug can cause constipation. This particular drug can cause ileus. So always 
monitor the development of ileus. Once if the patient develops ileus, and if you are going to give multi-dose actual charcoal, it is going to get clogged inside the intestines, causing perforation and worsening of the clinical condition. So advocated is just single dose activated charcoal and not the multi-dose activated charcoal. Even if you are planning to give single dose activated charcoal, it has to be given within less than two hours of ingestion and patient should be of normal mental status or with the protected airway irrespective of the mental status. Okay, hope you are clear with the activated charcoal. So, you are getting a patient who is completely asymptomatic now. He says that he has consumed some TCA drugs and he is completely asymptomatic. How to go with that? So, you have did J decontamination. Yes. You are taking an ECG and the ECG is normal or maybe some sinus tachycardia that should resolve. Normal QRS. There is no complex widening. And the patient remains asymptomatic for minimum 6 hours without an intervention. Then you can clear the patient for psychiatric evaluation or discharge. Okay, just 6 hours in your ER is more than enough. Make sure his mentation is normal. Make sure his ECG is normal. He doesn't have any altered metastasis. He doesn't have any hypotension or the symptoms that we discussed. Check for ADORA criteria. This is antidepressant overdose risk assessment criteria. That is, QRS more than 100 ms, cardiac dysarthmias, altered mental status, seizures, respiratory depression, hypotension and presentation ED or within 6 hours of ingestion. So, if your patient has any of this, do not discharge him. He requires treatment. And this ADORA is 100% sensitive to tell you that significant toxicity has set in. What if your patient has just sinus tachycardia and prolonged QT interval only, otherwise he is completely stable? How to approach these patients? So understand that sinus tachycardia because of TCA can persist up to one week after ingestion. So just because your patient has sinus tachycardia alone, it is not a condition, it is not a criteria to keep the patient in your hospital. So if it is more than 120 and if QT is high, then it comes to be a major toxicity. Otherwise, you need not treat this patient. You can just continue ECG monitoring. But if your patient has QT prolongation, then you need to treat your patient. So how are you going to treat your patient? Hope you remember the diagrams we discussed, right? You need a drug which can give some amount of alkalinity. You need a drug which can give some amount of sodium. So what is the drug? Soda bicarb. So sinus rhythm, the QRS of more than 100 ms itself, Give soda bicarb 1 to 2 milliequivalents per kg bolus in 3 to 5 minutes to till you reach a pH of around 7.55 or to reverse the abnormality, whichever is earlier. And you can continue at the main, twice the maintenance dose also. Connect 150 milliequivalents in 1 liter of D5. So either to revert the abnormality or to reach a serum pH of 7.5. Okay, this should be your ultimate target, not more than 7.55. Okay, next is if your patient has white complex tachycardia, apart from your soda bicarb, always try to correct hypoxia, acidemia, hypotension and you can use lidocaine, hypotonic saline and magnesium sulfate. If your patient has tosidy pointers, which is actually a rare in TCA, though there is QTC prolongation, I told you this QTC prolongation is not an issue with a repolarization, it is an issue with depolarization only. So, there is less likely that your patient can have a tosidy pointers. But still, if it is so, you can handle with cardioversion if the patient is unstable or magnesium sulfate. Hypotension with your fluids, correct the cause of hypotension and of course, soda bicarb will help you and nor epinephrine is a drug of choice. Uh, because dopamine is of not much use because your nerves are already dried up. For seizures, benzodiazepine, correct any subordinate causes, continuous infusion of midas and propofol. And neuromuscular relaxing if all these things fail. So understand this, both magnesium sulfate and correction of any subordinate causes is a mandatory. So what are the challenges you might face while handling a TCA poisoning? So your patient with TCA poisoning, he comes, you understood that alkalinity is helping, so you are going to give soda bicarb, right? So what if the alkalinity is reached, the pH is already 7.55, but the sodium is not yet reached or the abnormality is still persisting. What is the other drug where you can give sodium but not the bicarb? It's going to be 3% NS, right? You can use a 3% NS, 1 to 2 milliequivalents per kg in people 
whom you have already achieved your alkalotic range, but the abnormality in the ECG and other mentation still remains. In that case, you can give 3% sodium chloride. Okay. So, you started with sodium bicarb, but alkalinity is reached, but sodium is not reached. So, you are giving 3% sodium chloride. Now, the next challenge. What if your patient has increased chloride? Hyperchloremic acidosis. If the patients have high chloride, then you can switch over to sodium acetate. But what is wrong with sodium acetate is, the more you give sodium acetate, so because of acetate itself, patient can have hypotension. So, you cannot give sodium acetate if your patient has severe hypotension. So, next step is just hyperventilation. Hope you know that hyperventilation itself can cause some amount of alkalinity. So, this alkalinization to be continued minimum of around 24 hours after the ECG has been normalized. Either continue your solar bicarb or your 3% sodium chloride or your sodium acetate or by hyperventilation if the patient is intubated. All these things should be done minimum of 24 hours, 12 to 24 hours after the ECG has been normalized. ECG has been normalized, I mean not the sinus tachycardia, I mean to say the widening of QRS and QTC. So, the patient should have improved mental status. So, coming to the antiarrhythmics, wow, we have a wide range of antiarrhythmic drugs to handle the arrhythmias, right? So, we have class 1, which is 1A, 1B, 1C, class 2, class 3 and class 4. So, in our TCA, tricyclic antidepressants, hope you understood that this acts basically on the sodium channel. The sodium channels is already insulted. So, can you give one a drug? No, because it is going to prolong repolarization. Already your patients having an increased repolarization. The QTC is already prolonged. So, you cannot give 1A drugs. Can you give 1C? Again, no, because still it has effect on repolarization. This also increases your QTC. So, 1A, never. 1C, never. Then you have group B drugs. Will you give a beta blocker for a patient who is having profound hypotension? Answer is no. Again, the class 3 drugs prolongs a repolarization. Your QTC is already high. You are pushing your patient towards torsides pontus. So, again, you cannot give this. And the same reason, you cannot give calcium channel blocker in a patient who is having profound hypotension. So, the only class which reminds us 1B. It actually, though it is a sodium channel blocker, it usually shortens the repolarization. And among this, only lidocaine is proved helpful. There are some people who advocate against lidocaine because this is also a sodium channel blocker. But there are adequate papers which say lidocaine could be helpful, not as a first line, but as a second line of choice. So, ultimately, we don't have an effective drug to terminate if at all the patient has an arrhythmia, right? So, we need an effective terminator. So, what is the terminator you know of? No, 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 not this guy. Uh, I was speaking about a different terminator. I was speaking about magnesium. Okay. So, magnesium is a better drug which does not act, act much on the sodium. So, in case of refractory poisonings, ILE, intravenous lipid emulsions has been tried. Hope you know that this particular drug has high lipophilic activity. So, this lipid emulsions is uh, theoretically said that it can uh, scavenge the extra toxic drug which is present in your blood. Next is ECMO. Extracorporeal mechanical circulation could also help. And there is no much use in hemodialysis and hemoperfusion because as you already know, it is highly protein bound, very little amount is present in the blood and it is extensively distributed. The volume of distribution is very high. So, there is no much use in hemodialysis and hemoperfusion. There is no much evidence. So, prophylaxis. So, a patient comes to you having said that he has taken the TCAs, but his ECG is normal, he is not in white complex rhythms, his altered mental status is all normal, it's all settling or it's completely normal, he is completely asymptomatic. Should you give prophylaxis with soda bica? This is a question. Understand there is no evidence, there is absolutely no evidence for prophylactic alkalinization in the absence of cardiovascular toxicity. If the QRS duration is less than 100, need not give soda bica. Understand this. Because your hyperalkalinization without any reason inevitably decreases the potassium and ionistic calcium. This itself can cause QT prolongation and itself can cause dysrhythmias. So, take home messages no CVS issues, no soda bicarb. Okay. So, when can you discharge a patient? So, monitor for another 24 hours after termination of your therapy. What is the therapy? 
you're using alkalization using soda bicarb right that has to be stopped for minimum 24 hours and you need to observe the patient all your antiarrhythmics is stopped and you have observed the patient for 24 hours your inotropes vasopressors everything is stopped and you have observed the patient for 24 hours and all the clinical toxicity is over and you have observed significantly only then he is fit to be discharged so a patient who is coming with a tca toxicity can have altered mentation the seizures or the cardiovascular effects hypotension and arrhythmias do the ecg check for hypotension check for altered metastasis if required give soda bicarb and maintain the abc properly active red charcoal is not of much use and make sure that your patient is completely safe monitor a minimum of 24 hours and then plan for discharge before discharge you need to have a psychiatric consultation so now having understood about the tca toxicity let's answer this very very simple question hope every one of you will get the answer correct whoever uh, listened to this class completely i'm very sure you will get the answers correct right alkalinization of urine helps in decreasing ca toxicity so what is the answer does alkalinization of urine helps in decreasing tca toxicity answer is false understand dear friends till now i was telling you about alkalinization in the blood not the urine okay it is the blood that has to be made in the alkaline range up to 7.55 ph not the urine so urine alkalinization does not enhance and actually may reduce the urinary clearance because of passive reabsorption of non ionized ca from the alkaline urine hope you remember that 5% of the drug is excreted unchanged in the kidneys through the kidneys so even a patient's aka has uh, more potential to develop toxicity so if you alkalinize your urine it can itself cause a reabsorption of the drug thus increasing the toxicity and urine alkalinization is not going to be helpful in ca okay having understood this get the psychiatric consultation and then discharge your patient safely thank you